Welcome. We're ecstatic that you've tuned in today to worship with us. We've just come out of Easter Sunday and we have that joyous momentum that Christ is risen and we are here to praise him. So join us together as we give honor and glory to the risen King. We are called to obey God's commandments and live in God's love. The ways which God ordains are of peace and of hope, and the love of God shall conquer the world. Rejoice, O people of God, for God is near. Praise God for his power and his might, for God's love and his peace. Amen. As we worship together, we have the opportunity to admit to ourselves, to each other, and to God that we do not always live as we are called. In this time of confession, this time of opening our hearts, let us remember that God is merciful and just, eager to offer grace and love. Let us pray first in silence. Gracious God, source of all life, Lord of mercy and grace, Hear our prayer today. We come before you in need of healing, the healing of our bodies and souls, the healing of our relationships, and the healing of our pride, fear, and apathy. We know that with you, nothing is impossible, not even our healing or the restoration of the world. We pray that you will heal us and that you will heal our world so that we will be free to serve, love, and be as Christ calls us to be. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Love doesn't boast, 
Love after all matters most. Love doesn't run. Love doesn't hide. Love doesn't keep you locked inside. Love is a river that flows through, and love never fails you. Love will sustain, love will provide, love will not cease at the end of time, love will protect, love always holds, love still believes you when you When my own won't make a sound When I can't turn back around When the sky's falling down Nothing is greater than this Greater than this When my own won't make a sound When I can't turn back around Just falling down Nothing is greater than this Greater than this Love is not here Love is a lie Love is the way The truth of life Love is the place you fly to And love never fails you Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, 
but then we will see face to face. For I know only in part, then I will fully know, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How many of us have heard that passage that was just read at a wedding? Yep, me too. In fact, when I imagine this passage, I often visualize a loving couple gazing into each other's eyes as they're soon to be wed at a beautiful ceremony, and it's just beautiful and romantic. But when I started to study this text, I, I realized that this Corinthian love chapter, a chapter that's known as Paul's greatest literary work, really didn't have that kind of love in it. It wasn't a romantic kind of love. So today, we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, love. But a love that is sacrificial, unconditional, a love for the sake of the other. I'm talking about an agape kind of love. We know that love is the foundation of Christian ethics. Jesus told us that the greatest two commandments were to love the Lord, your God, and to love your neighbor. But what is love and how do we know what that actually looks like from a scriptural standpoint? In 1965, Jackie DeShannon released a hit song that simply stated, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul tells this church that they need love. Someone once stated that the church would be great if there weren't people. Yikes. You know, church can be a wonderful thing. It can be a blessing. It can be an encouragement. It can be where you go to get fed and strengthened. But it can also be a place that you're offended at, that you're hurt, where you get hurt or perhaps even deeply wounded. Because the local church is a gathering of a body of humans and in our humanity, we are oftentimes selfish. We're wrong, we're salty, we're systematically flawed. It's certainly true that the world needs love, but Paul says that the church is also a place that deeply needs love, a love that embodies Christ's love. Before we journey into our text today, let's just take a moment and look at the Greco-Roman world where this church is mentioned. The city of Corinth had a reputation for trouble, and it was even the namesake for a verb. To be Corinthianized meant something like to become thoroughly immoral, materialistic. It was a place where the rich became wealthier and the poor became more oppressed. It's not a place emulating Christ and his love at all. Now in our canon, in our Bible, we have these two Corinthian letters. However, there's evidence that there were more than two letters. There were actually four letters to the Corinthian church. So 1 Corinthians, where our text is taken from today, was actually not the first letter that Paul sent to these believers. Of all the New Testament churches we know of, we know about the Corinthian church the most. Why is that? Well, it's because Paul had a deep love for the Corinthians. But these believers were really a pain in Paul's side. They were a thorn in his flesh. The Corinthian believers managed to misunderstand just about everything that Paul taught them and said to them and that he did to their own detriment and to Paul's astonishment. Michael Gorman notes that by the time Paul wrote the letter we call 1 Corinthians, the church was in utter chaos with a laundry list of problems. 
So Paul writes this letter to strengthen, to sanctify, and unify the community by urging its members to let all be done in love. Now, from the get-go, Paul lists multiple divisions within this Corinthian body, whether they were acting impatiently during Holy Communion, whether they were being envious or resentful of other people's spiritual gifts or leadership positions in the church. Some of them were puffing themselves up that they were more spiritual than others. They were even resentful of other people's wealth and shamefully committing immoral grievances. Yet, when we get to chapter 13, Paul provides the solution to all these issues. He uses the phrase, more excellent. In the Greek, more excellent is a hyperbole. And a hyperbole is just something that's an exaggeration for effect, right? It's an intentional use of an overspeak, such as, I cried a river of tears, or I've told you a million times. Now, moms, maybe you really have told your child to clean up their toys a million times. But Paul, here in our text, is urgently saying there is something indescribably better than all these issues I've previously mentioned. Paul begins by asserting that everything is lost, all the gifts, if an individual does not possess agape love, which is always demonstrated by action. So let's get into our text. In this chapter, Corinthians 13, Paul describes love's necessity. We see that in verses one through three. Paul describes love's character in verses four through seven love's performance in verses 8 through 12, and its superiority in the final closing statement. Despite the absence of any explicit reference to God or the Spirit or the agape love, the love described in this chapter is clearly the fruit of the Spirit the sort of love that only God gives to his children and to the world, and a Christ-demonstrated love that's evidenced by his death on the cross, as we just remembered all throughout our Lenten journey. Paul's beginning words cut right to the point. He says, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries of all the knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not love, I am nothing. The use of tongues or any other spiritual gift that is not done in love cancels out any status the person he or she might have done. It makes them nothing. When Paul references noisy gongs and clangs, he's talking about temple worship where they would bang together these uh, symbols and they would be crying out and making noise to these false gods. He says, that is nothing. Their gods don't hear them. Action in love is a necessity it is the hallmark of a true believer. In the next section, the central section of Paul's discussion, we see 16 different descriptions and characteristics of love. Love does X, love does not do Y. Starting in 1 Paul 4, Paul notes, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always 
perseveres. For Paul, the character of love is an action verb, a set of principles which these Corinthian believers were not emulating. Earlier in this letter that Paul wrote, he's war he warns the Corinthians that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. All things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. Do not seek your own advantage, but that of the other. Paul goes on in verses 8 through 12 discussing love from another viewpoint. It's permanence in this age and in the resurrected age to come. Verse 13 leads us to the final claim, the Pauline triad of faith, hope, and love. And we see in verse 13, but the greatest of these is love. Love is the answer to all the division and the enduring rule for the life of the church. Now let's take a moment. Let's think about our own lives, our own patterns. Do we have anything that kind of looks like the Corinthian church? Let's think about the past month. Have we been unkind, unloving, rude, selfish towards others? What about this week? What about this morning or today or tonight? Perhaps you've noticed some unloving patterns in your life. Perhaps you've noticed the divisive attitudes, assumed intentions, and general unkindness of the culture in which we live. It's easy to love those that think and act as we do. However, as Christians, we are called to love those that are hard to love. We are called to love those who think differently than we do. Growing up, I had a lot of siblings, and you know, as siblings get together, sometimes we fight. <laughs> well, if we would be squabbling and fighting, my mother would eventually break up the fight, and one of her ways of correcting us was to make us hug whoever we were fighting with. So if it was my brother that I was fighting with, she would make me hug him, and he would have to hug me back. And now we would be fuming. We did not want to hug each other. We didn't want to see each other. We didn't want to talk to each other. But as we were standing there, and my mother would watch us, and we'd have to hug each other, eventually that anger subsided, and laughter took its place. Laughter because we thought this was ridiculous that our mother made us do this, but laughter because by the time we were done, we didn't even know what we were fighting about. As a church, you know, we're called to a greater love. If we as a church want to be Christ-centered, welcoming all, then we need to start with love. What the church needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little love, God's love. Just for 
Go forth celebrating faith, hope, and love. Go forth to be a transformed, loving people that God calls us to be. Go forth to a transform the world in times of prosperity, but also in times of doubt. Go forth with the knowledge that you are always surrounded with God's agape love. Amen. <laughs>